Welcome into another edition of Every Hornets Box Score, the only podcast that dares dive into every single Hornets box score in franchise history. I'm Doug Branson. I'm joined alongside by my co-host with the Mo host from Locked On Hornets, <laughs> Walker Mail Walker. How are you, my friends? I'm doing well. Ready to look back on another day in Charlotte Hornets history. We'll see what kind of interesting game we have here. We've been blessed with some good ones, so hopefully the Bees machine delivers on yet what is another good contest in Hornets history. Yeah, you really, you really never know. And for those unfamiliar, uninitiated, maybe you're just checking out every Hornets box score for the first time, the Bees machine is an actual machine that we concocted. I built it with my bare hands, uh, and and it takes the chaos that is every single. Or were you thinking that I actually had bare hands? Like, like I think you have to have bare hands to handle this machine. You can't do it with human hands. No, yeah, no, not these hands. Not my. Not my bear, B A R E hands. I actually, uh, sl- I slayed a bear, and yeah. it was le- it was legal hunting. So don't get into my mentions and talk about yeah. hunting regulations. It was legal hunting. Plus, I- plus, as the as the as the Constitution states, you have the right to bear hands. So that's don't right, that Doug. That's right, and bear arms as well. <laughs> bear um, legs. Let's just become bears, and that way we can handle the bees machine. They like honey. It works. All of it works. It's ex- exactly so. The bees machine uh, takes the chaos that is every single Hornets box score. It randomly selects one for us to discuss on each of these episodes, and and then we we go to work and and dive deep on it. Uh, so we'll we'll get to that in a moment. Just want to say quickly, every Hornets box score is a. Uh, so is a viewer, is a listener, is a reader supported endeavor. It is a labor of love uh, from me and Walker, uh, definitely, and David Walker. They all uh, give their time. Uh, freely to me to help me out, but um, I'm trying to cover the Hornets uh, both historically and presently in a way that's not being done anywhere else. So go to every Hornets box score. You can subscribe for free, but also uh, consider uh, giving us a few bucks, giving me a few bucks uh, to help uh, continue to do this uh, work. So without further ado, Walker, if you are ready, I am ready uh, to hit this bees machine and find out exactly what we're going to be uh, dealing with here. Yeah, I'm so ready, man. I mean, it's always like a little. I kind of get into a, you get scared, flinch, you know, position. I just you, you got to protect yourself, but I'm I'm still ready though. It's a scary thing, but I'm I'm glad you're brave enough to endure it. So mm-hmm. uh, without further ado, oh, there's the sound. Bees, bees everywhere! It's going to work, baby. It's hard. I think that was a X-ray machine of some kind. I think we're I think we're. Real- yeah, we're just rotating in the future. Okay, what? Oh, close game immediately. <laughs> yeah, 102 to 100. Charlotte okay. Hornets over the Denver Nuggets. We have been transported back to January 13th, 1997, Walker. So we're dealing with the 96 97 Hornets. Some of the best Hornets seasons of all yeah. time occurred during this period. But the Hornets get the dub. Over a miserable Nuggets team, 102 oh, yeah, uh, wow. to 100. So let's let's dig around in this game. Let's go to the let's go to the line score here. First thing I'm seeing, Walker, is that <laughs> amazingly <laughs> what kind of game. So so we have a 102 to 100, 96, 97. So like yes, this is kind of the era to not score many points. Where even overtime barely allows you to hit triple digits but they didn't score in overtime like look at it's the hornets scoring two that was it we saw one i mean maybe bucket a couple free throws but that was it that we saw for the hornets and they ended up winning because of it yeah and two points scored in a a total of not two points by each team a total (laughs) of two points scored in the entire overtime period that uh, that is an NBA record. Uh, no, there has never been an instance. I looked this up. There's, there's never been an instance where an overtime has included only two points, and and it's the it's the only time. It's only one of three times in NBA history in the shot clock era that either team has been unable to score. Three points in an overtime, three or more, two, you know, three or more points in an overtime. It's crazy. That's unbelievable to have one bucket 
go for the Charlotte Hornets in overtime and ended up beating them. And plus, like, I always like exploring this type of era because this is the, the Glenn Rice years. We all know how great of a player he was. Anthony Mason comes over too. Like, that was an awesome little transition for the Hornets. But I always I feel like that's kind of an overlooked era because as awesome as they were, you don't think about them as much as the early Hornets with Zoe, LJ, and Muggsy. I don't even think most people consider them as important as the 2001 Hornets, where they are one game away from getting to the Eastern Conference Finals. Jamal Mashburn, Baron Davis. So even with Glenn Rice putting together the best season we've ever seen from a Hornet, you know, having the best three-year stretch probably from any Hornet we've ever seen, we don't think about this era as much, despite having a Mace, a Rice, Muggsy still being a part of this team. So I always, I always enjoy like the '95 to '97 region of Hornets history. All right, yeah, let's let's do it. Since you mentioned it, let's give people a little bit of uh, season context before we figure out who scored those two points. We got to figure out who scored those two points. The gate. <laughs> what ended right. up being the? I don't know if it was at the overtime buzzer, but it ended up being the game deciding bucket in overtime. But let's take a look at the ninety six, ninety seven Hornets. They finished with a record of fifty four and twenty eight. A lot of wins. Uh, that's the best record in franchise history. But this is the amazing part. So best record in franchise history, but they finished fourth in the NBA Central Division. Now you have to keep in mind that during this time, the Hornets were in the Central Division because there were only two divisions in the Eastern Conference, and they were in the they were in the Central Division with Chicago, with Atlanta, with a really good Cleveland team. So they get 54 wins, which is good enough now to win your division almost automatically, unless you happen to be you know in a heated battle for the top of the Eastern Conference within your division. But 54 wins, especially I think in the Southeast Conference nowadays, Walker, 54 would be a- almost automatic. Uh, oh, yeah. you know division win well what was it the hornets i mean they haven't come close to 50 wins in a while and yet they mm-hmm. had a shot at the division title maybe it was a like was it a couple years ago because yes. the division was just so lousy and they've well, never they've never won the division title a couple years ago they got close and they were like 140 you know it was something insignificant you're, you are you are dead on, my friend. So uh, they've never won their division. They've come in second place four times in franchise history, but only once since they returned uh, from uh, the, the, the New Orleans debacle. And that one time happened in 28, 2018, 2019. That's the first year of James Borrego, that Kimball Walker final explosion mm-hmm. year. Okay, but they didn't mi- they didn't make the playoffs. They finished under 500, but the Southeast Division was so miserable that, that was good <laughs> enough for second place in the division. Right. Uh, so some, yeah, really odd things happening in terms of, yeah, even the year t- 2016 when they made the playoffs, because there were several teams that they were tussling with and that and it ca- all came down to tiebreakers they ended up third in the southeast um in in that season so yeah i mean 54 wins coached by dave cowan's executive was bob bass this is kind of golden era hornets but they they were kind of middle of the road offensively 12th of 29th in the league in points per game uh, 15th in the league. Uh, yeah. the man, Steve Clifford would love this team. Nice balance here. 15th in defense, or at least opponent's points per game. Offensive rating, though, they were 4th in the league in offense. Uh, so they weren't scoring a ton of points, but they were doing it efficiently. Defensive rating was 22nd of 29. So I take that back. Right. Steve Clifford would yeah. hate this team. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, quite the opposite. What a, what a weird set of statistics, though, right? Like This is a team with 54 wins. It's a lot of wins. And you don't see anything special except for the offensive rating. And and this was a, well, they, a year, or a, an arrow that was built on defense. But I guess if that's the case and you're that efficient offensively, maybe you are able to get 50 wins because you were able to score. Remember, t- like Glenn Rice is doing a lot of the heavy lifting here. Yeah. The, the fact that he shot so efficiently from deep in an era that you didn't have so many players like that, where his volume wasn't crazy considering what it is now. But then he was shooting a lot of threes and hitting all of them like I I could talk about Glenn Rice all day long man that that three-year stretch he had is just absolutely bananas and would be in this era considering what he did then 
it's even more you know out of this world like here it would be in in 2022 it would be outlandish well, you, you hit on it. Um, they had Glenn Rice and they had Del Curry have yeah. some pretty amazing three-point shooting performances. And so they, they had half the formula, right? This team had the space. They just didn't do the pace. They were 22nd in the league in pace at a miserable 88.6. So they were grinding it out. But when they put up shots... Uh, enough of those shots were three pointers that went in that it caused their offensive. Ra- I'm surprised that it took so long for for the NBA to figure this out. They should have figured it out. They're like, wait a minute, how is a team that scores the 12th most points in the NBA fourth in offensive rating? Maybe they didn't even think about offensive rating then. But how how are they the most efficient team? Oh, that's right, Glenn Rice. They they shot 43 percent as a team right. from three. That's how they did it because three can is you better than two. Down- can you scroll down on the roster real quickly? Okay, so just yeah to highlight the roster. Okay, um, we do not have Tony Bennett on this roster, but I was going to make the comparison of Virginia having the worst pace in college basketball, but also being the most efficient offensive team in college mm-hmm. basketball. And it's not like they're – I mean, they've had some excellent shooters before, but they are not going to beat you in transition. They are just going to score on a lot of their possessions. And the Hornets having kind of that – they – you know, kind of having that same philosophy. Tony Bennett would, I guess, later play for the Hornets. Not not quite yet, though. But you got a veteran-laden team here. You've got Del Curry in his 10th season. You've got Vladi Divac in his 7th season. Vladi Dari. You've got Matt Geiger in his 4th season. You've got – Glenn Rice in his seventh season, Donald Royal, Tony Smith in their sixth season. Got a couple rookies, Tony Delk and Malik Rose. Uh, I don't think they're going to contribute much this season. Uh, but then, of yeah. course, you've got Muggsy Bogues in the, in the ninth season. Tom, and a couple of old heads as well, Tom Chambers in his 14th season. <laughs> Well, that this this team actually has some like solid NBA head names to it. So yeah. Ricky Pierce in his 14th season, sure. Tom Chambers, same thing, has an all star appearance. Of course, you know, we love Mad Geiger. Tony Delk is a nice NBA head name. We all know Scott Burrell, certainly because of the last dance. And Malik Rose would go on to win some championships with the Spurs and be a part of what was some early success. Tim Duncan, David Robinson era Spurs championship team. So just a lot of interesting interesting names if you were a fan back at this time and Ricky Pierce started in 17 of these games and played you know significant minutes so it wasn't I mean he wasn't like a major contributing factor but he was another good shooter on this team he attempted to uh, a game which was a lot for the era and uh hit on 53 almost 54 yeah. percent of his wow three pointers okay. Glenn Rice was 47%. Uh, Tony Delk, in a small sample size, was 46%. Anthony Goldwire uh, put up two and a half uh, a game. Uh, and again, a small sample size, but 40, 44%. I mean, this was just an extraordinary three point shooting. Uh, season and yeah team. look at well look and i and i do believe this year too muggsy shot 40 right, almost shot 42 percent right, right right so if you so click on click on muggsy stats just real quickly if you click on this it is the outlier three-point year for muggsy never Nuts. would he ever do anything like this again not even attempts look at attempts nope. so nope. he doesn't even break one three-point attempt per game until this 96 97 season That's right. when he when he and he played in 65 we're not talking about a couple of game sample size here played in 65 games started all of them he shot two point this if we ever get mugsy on this show and trust me I'm trying if we, I'm trying Jennifer if we ever get mugsy on this show that is the only that's the yeah. first and only question I want answered is mugsy one number one why did you all of a sudden dis- decide to shoot a bunch of threes was it a coach telling you hey giving you that opportunity was it just like right because look afterwards he doesn't shoot one a game ever again it it's so bizarre i've done research on this before when i was looking at the best three-point shooting seasons in hornets history I, i think i tweeted this out maybe like a year or two ago but it is totally bizarre the fact that 32 year old Muggsy Bogues at this stage in his career on a large sample in again 65 games that he started was still a big part of this team 
had over two attempts per game and shot 42% from three. It is absolutely bonkers. And when you look at his effective field goal percentage, his true shooting percentage, it goes up. Look at his field goal percentage. It stays around the same in what he shot for his career. In fact, it's almost identical to what his career percentage is. Gets to the foul line, shoots 85%. Still is averaging seven assists per game. Like this year for Muggsy at 32, okay? 32-5-3 is a crazy effective point guard at this time. So yeah, like what what a season for him, man. It, that that is such a cool year. Well, and if I could speculate here and and I wonder if this would be part of the answer for Muggsy is that he's coming off a season in which he had a um an injury that kept him out nearly the entire season. So I wonder if like coming back he just wasn't the same Muggsy because Muggsy lived by you know driving, kicking, you know, getting getting into the lane and, and, and or driving and pulling up. Yeah. Like it wasn't you know maybe a lot of these were catch and shoot that were facilitated by other players because he was kind of getting back into the groove of things coming off uh, that season where he only played in six games in 95 96. Well, and I don't want to focus too much on this, but if you if you look just real quickly, so has the 65 game season for the Hornets and then plays two more. That's it. Plays two more games after that outlier type season for him at the v- pretty close to very end of his career. Plays two more games and then the rest of the season goes to Golden State. Yep. And look at the difference there. Like, just doesn't play that style again. Plays in only 36 games for the Warriors. He goes to the Raptors. If you know anything about the end of his career, you've known this already. But just doesn't that that year effectively the last season for the Hornets was was maybe his best I mean seriously it's it's nuts it is it is pretty insane so one day we'll get Muggsy on we'll ask him about that Uh, so just hold hold on to that little piece of information but we have to go back to this game because something has been really bothering me they only score two points in overtime again the, the the only two points of the game of the overtime was scored by the Charlotte Hornets that's an NBA record uh lowest scoring overtime in NBA history and so let me click on OT1 here. And it's Tony <laughs> Smith, okay? Tony Smith, one oh, of four. One of four in the overtime period. Wait a minute. Let me go back to the game. One of six for the game, Walker. So what yeah. I'm telling you is that Tony Smith hit one basket in this entire game, only took six shots. Five of those shots came in overtime, and, and his only bucket – was the game deciding bucket in the lowest scoring overtime in NBA history? This is Walker. This is the only sudden death in NBA overtime in history. Tony Smith outscored the Denver Nuggets in overtime and outscored everybody else on his own team in overtime <laughs> in order to win the game by scoring, yes, just one bucket. And he only what scored in once in the entire game. So this is weird. Tony Smith starts actually had quite a bit of starts in his career and scores two points. Doug, if you don't mind, I would like Uh to take this time to go down my rabbit hole. Oh, boy. Okay, yep. You're ready? Here it comes. Tony, not a phony. (laughs) That's what I'll call it. So, Tony, if you go back to his career. (laughs) So, surprisingly, right? Seems like your neighbor maybe owns a restaurant, a nice pizzeria that you go to, and it's one of those holes. Yeah, you're right. It's It's an average name. Yeah. Tony Smith, yeah. Yeah, never heard of him, to be honest with you. But probably should have. Started 87 games in his career, played for wow. close to a decade, so a long NBA career for him. His first start of the 93-94 season, the Lakers beat the reigning Western Conference champs against the Phoenix Suns, Charles Barkley, all those guys. And Tony goes for 20 points in the 93-94 season, so had 39 games that he started, 37, I should say, for the Lakers that year. Started 39 for the Hornets, excuse me, 31 for the Lakers, started 39 games for the Charlotte Hornets in this season that we're talking about. So if you go to his, um, this is just kind of like a a collage of Tony Smith facts real quick. Mm -hmm. Tony played for one season here in Charlotte, but if you go to his Twitter account, his profile pic is actually of him in a Hornets jersey. You can follow him on Twitter. We'll give him the plug at Analyst T Smith 34. Does a lot for Milwaukee, went to Marquette, was the leading scorer for Marquette before Marcus Howard actually broke that as far as a single season points per game average a few years back. But Tony Smith had that record until Marcus Howard showed up. 
I want to talk about one notable game that he had in his career. So more notable, notable than the time that he scored two points, the only two points in, a, in an overtime that was the lowest scoring overtime in NBA history. More notable than that. It's one of the most impactful games in NBA history. Okay. Yeah. Um, how about MJ's first championship? That's wow. right. Most notable game I could find for Tony was game five. That was the clincher for Michael Jordan's first ever championship against the L.A. Lakers. This was Tony Smith's rookie year. Didn't play much at all in the postseason. Played a little bit his rookie year. You see 64 appearances there, averaged 11 minutes per game, but didn't average too many minutes in the postseason, but did play 30 minutes in game five and scored 12 points. He was one of seven players to log minutes alongside Eldon Campbell in that game. Eldon oh, future Hornet. Yep. Future Beanie uh, yeah. Baby. You have Vladi Divac also there, too, with the Hornets. Hornet. Three, three Hornets in game five. Three. Ah, ah, ah. On that Lakers team. Um, but, yeah, to, so Tony Smith, rookie season. And that game was close, by the way. It was tied going into the fourth quarter. And then the Bulls would outscore them by seven. Then you get the Michael Jordan first ever championship. He also fouled out of that game, by the way. So Tony scoring 12 points, being a big contributor, fouls out and then you know, Chicago wins. Last thing I'll say about Tony, if you look up his highlights on YouTube, I wanted to see if there was like any plays I could mention. Mm -hmm. it, it only shows one thing that I could find, like two videos down. It shows him blowing a wide-open dunk against Sacramento at the end. All good, because the Lakers end up winning anyway, like 128 to 123, but he was going to do the exclamation point dunk at the end. Nobody's guarding him, but it rims out, and they just hold the ball for the rest of the possession. Only Tony Smith highlight reel I could find. But Tony, not a phony, interesting career for the guy that scored two points in overtime to beat Denver. That's crazy. What's also crazy is that I'm looking at this, and Anthony Mason played every single minute of this basketball game. He tallied 53 minutes. Vladi Dottie had 40, almost 50 minutes, so he only got a very short breather. But Anthony Mason in this game, you know, we talk, you know, Tony won the game, but uh, technically. But Anthony right. Mason, uh, he gets my do it in the box score award because he did it in the box score in minutes played, 53. Eight of 10 from the field. That's 80% if you're counting. He was uh, three of six from the line. 19 points, 12 rebounds, 7 assists, and go ahead and add 2 blocks and only 1 turnover to that 7 assists. Yeah, Just a man. vintage Anthony Mason performance to get the dub over this miserable Nuggets team. What an awesome player, man. I mean, Anthony Mason was so unique because the dude is round, okay? Like, that is, that is a globe out there on the court. He was, he was thick. And the fact that he played 53 minutes and plays so different than what you would expect a guy that size, because he wasn't crazy tall and it, it had a little bit of the Charles Barkley thing going on and it, not as athletic as Charles, but man, the fact that he was able to log those, that many rebounds, that many assists, just such a good passer. And to be that efficient playing every second of this game, absolutely nuts, man, from Anthony Mason. I also want to point this out. How about my boy Anthony Goldwire going in for five minutes and chucking five shots, including three three-pointers, and missing all of them? So, yeah, not the greatest game for Goldwire. Well, bro, you know, I'm always looking for my Hong Kong award. I'm always looking for the just the goose eggs all the way across the board. And George Zedek, <laughs> yeah. God bless him. God bless George Zedek. He almost got it, uh, but he got three minutes in this game, did get a rebound, did get a steal and a turnover, so had a little bit of action action there did not get the Hong Kong award there is somebody later on when we get to we'll get to this Denver Nuggets team in a minute uh, there was somebody that was even closer to getting the Hong Kong award uh, but look at Vladi Dottie right now 12 points 16 rebounds and you're saying you're saying man how did Vladi and Anthony Mason pile up all these stats seven assists for Anthony Mason Vladi gets 16 rebounds Anthony Mason gets 12 rebounds what what's going on well it's because Glenn Rice and Del Curry are doing a bulk of the scoring and really not anything else right Glenn Rice 25 points in this game only mm -hmm. three rebounds no assists no steals we did have a block uh, Del Curry same story 23 points five personal fouls getting a little handsy there Del watch your hands <laughs> Uh, three steals in the game and a block. This is actually a, a weirdly wow. 
a strangely good defensive game for Del Curry. And I don't mean – Del Curry would say that. Like, Del Curry has made no uh, right. bones about it on the broadcast. He, is, he was not a great defensive player, but did at least have the stats here. Uh, but no rebounds, no assists in this game either. So it's all – in a very – in a weird way – like your your guard play, oh, the Muggsy tallying up the assists, but so much of your guard play is happening from Anthony Mason in this season. It's it's an odd way they've got it constructed here. You know, Doug. The more I look at this this roster, is this the best? Is your best five man rotation in history at one point? This roster with Del Curry substituted in for Tony Smith, because that's an incredible five. If you're running, if you're running Del Curry along Muggsy this year, where he has the whole three point thing yeah. happen, Glenn Rice, Vladi was an awesome passer too. We know the type of season that Anthony Mason had. I believe he would have one more year. We had an All NBA type season with the Miami Heat. Um, yeah, like that is that five the best you could put. The only thing is. You know, you didn't have any depth with this team, you know, so you had Dell coming off the bench. But, you know, even as much as we're giving Tony some credit here, I, I would say this team was not very deep. You're not going to the bench a whole lot or to outside of that top five and right. really feeling good. The, the earlier teams, you did have some depth. You know, you had your starting five and then you had guys coming off the bench that you felt a little better about. But but that five, man, that's a that's a good squad. And that's how you're able to win 54, you know, like put your best players out there and you can win, you know, 54 games. Right. And this supports you, Walker, in that notion. And, and we we've talked about this when we did the 30 best players in Hornets history. You know, Anthony Mason and Glenn Rice were able to tally all NBA honors for the mm -hmm. Charlotte Hornets. And it really was because they accumulated so many many minutes they had to eat all of those minutes because this Hornets team didn't really have much depth and it would unfortunately sort of end this era in a way because Anthony Mason would go on to get injured and and really sort of put an end to this whole block of players that the Hornets almost tasted glory with but yeah I, I can't I can't argue with you honestly I mean 54 wins says everything you need to know and, and I would say this that five I think would smoke unfortunately would smoke my favorite team those early aughts teams you know with mash and b diddy That's, i mean they, yeah not enough offensive firepower on this it's too gritty i think good defensive teams but i i like the offense on this team to beat that that grinded out defense yeah just some house cleaning by the way i said tony bennett after i meant tony bennett before it already been gone from this team but if, if you go back you still have del curry in the like the 93 92 era del curry Kenny Gaddison, Kendall Gill, Larry Johnson, Alonzo Mourning, Johnny Newman, J.R. Reed was able to bring you some depth. So that, that team had more depth. But this, this starting five, you know, you put them alongside that 2000, 2001 team. That's a good starting five as well. But yeah, man, that's that was a uh, that was an impressive group of five players. Yeah, the other 50 win team, that 94, 95 team uh, with, yeah, Muggsy, that, that's sort of your your peak Zoe Hersey morning. being there, he, Hersey was good that year. Yeah, Hersey, Michael Adams, get the Gap Man. You can't go wrong with the Gap Man. Tommy T with the frosted tips. Tom <laughs> <That's right. laughs> Joe Wolf, uh, former heel. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, that was uh, and talk about you know a really balanced team. You know, that was a team that really didn't did there it on both go. ends of the floor. They were top ten in offense and defense, ninth in both offensive rating and defensive rating. So well, yeah, and you know, that's okay. What, I think this that, 94, 95 team might rival it. Well, yeah, and maybe not the top five, but but certainly the depth. That that will will help you. I mean, you can go to the bench and, and not um, have this huge drop off. Now that's the team Steve Clifford would love. Top ten offense and defense. That's what he preached when he was here with the Hornets the first go around. Well, that's the team Steve Clifford would love. And he would love it because it would deliver to him two things that he has never had as a coach of the Charlotte Hornets. One, a super, a bona fide Hall of Fame superstar, and two, a big man uh, that could command the paint and run people out of it and, and was also not a hindrance offensively. Oh, so, no, yeah. he scored 20. Yeah, crazy. Right.
Um, so that's that's the one thing the Hornets in their current iteration have never been able to deliver to Steve Clifford, unfortunately. Okay, I do want to pop over to this Denver Nuggets thing because there are a couple of interesting things to point out. Let's go over the roster really quickly. In this game, your starters, Mark Jackson, dropped a 50-burger, not points, but minutes played. Irvin Johnson uh, on this team. Dale Ellis, one of your favorites, I think, Walker, right? You're a big Dale Ellis Yeah, I like fan. Dale Ellis. Yeah, I don't know if I've ever revealed that before, but I, I definitely like Dale Ellis. Now, were Dale Ellis and Lafonso Ellis, who both started in this game for Denver, were they are they related? Do we know? This? I don't think so. I've never heard that before. Lafonso, uh, uh, Lafonso, a college basketball analyst now, um, you know, went to Maryland, I believe. So, but yeah, I don't, I don't think he's brothers with Dale. Uh, but we can look it up. Uh, yeah, I'll look it up in a minute. Good, good luck pronouncing this next starter, Bryant Stith, maybe. Stith, yeah, Stith. Bryant Stith. Oh, yeah, I was close. I went Ith. I went Stith instead of Stith. I mean, I guess you could be right. I thought it was always death, but. Well, okay. The reserves, there's an interesting name. Darvin Ham, current uh, head coach yeah. of the Los Angeles Lakers. Ricky Pierce. I was I say, th- he played for the Hornets this season. Y- yeah. Hey, wait a minute. Yeah, right. <laughs> Where did you go? <laughs> Swips, snip, snap, snip, snap. <laughs> Where's Ricky? Look okay, this is interesting just... too. If if just an oddity, th- so I said they have Dale Ellis and Lafonso Ellis, which we don't know if they're related or not. They also had two Thompsons, Brooks That's Thompson right. and LaSalle Thompson, coming off the bench. And I told you LaSalle, uh, with a minute forty one in this game, was so close to the Hong Kong award, which is goose eggs across the box score, but did pick up a personal foul late in this one. Um, so unfortunately, can't give him the award. Antonio McDyess. Uh, Antonio McDyess did not dress for this game. Probably lucky. What an awesome name! Yeah, for the Hornets. That he Antonio McDyess is an awesome name. That's a that's a good one. Um, you know, probably did hurt the Nuggets that he wasn't playing for them. Mark Jackson. I forget about that Nuggets era. I, I'm sure I'm not alone in that. 18 assists for Mark Ooh. Jackson. By the way. All right, I got an award for him. March okay. of Dimes. Okay. Yeah. The March Crazy. of Dimes award. I'm handing it to Mark Jackson. This is when, and I've got an award for Vladi Dotti too. Uh, this is when you have more assists than points when you score ten or more points. That's the March okay. of Dimes. When you're okay. out there, you're you're scoring, you're you're getting yours, but you're making sure that everybody else gets theirs because you're all about the charity. So it's March of Dimes, eighteen assists, thirteen points. What did I? Okay, I have an award for Vladi. Vladi, same situation here except it's rebounds. He had sixteen rebounds and twelve points, so he got his points, but he made sure to hit the boards. Oh, I know what it was. The award is called I'd Rather Have a Beer, and it's named after that scene in Billy Madison <laughs> where the janitor. Uh, uh, where Billy Madison offers the janitor milk and the janitor says, I'd rather have a beer. So this is the janitor award, the cleanup. Okay. He's on the boards, okay. 16 rebounds, 12 points. Flotty Dotty gets the I'd rather have a beer award, the working man. Yeah, I mean, that's that's excellent. I like how you went uh, around your bleep to get to your elbow in order to name that. <laughs> that's always a very, very <laughs> awesome title. I definitely like that. I'm trying to look up Mark Williams. What a, like... For for somebody that has a lot of cachet, especially, you know, since we've seen him become a head coach and, of course, had the Warriors for a little while, be an analyst for a long time. But I think most people think of him for the Knicks and then, uh, the, then the Pacers, that finals run where he was alongside Reggie Miller, um, but also played for the Clippers, you know, and, and then here had this stint with the Nuggets. Just an interesting career for Mark Jackson that... Also, I think a second all time in assist behind John Stockton, um, or used to be. Yeah, just like a weird, actually up at the top of a lot of different things you might think about in NBA lore, and yet isn't the crazy star that that he'll be alongside with some of those other names. Okay, check this out. I'm on the Denver Nuggets uh, 96-97 roster and stats page on Basketball Reference, and I'm looking at their coach. They obviously fired, and if this is in order, then they fired Bernie Bickerstaff, a name that any Hornets head of any note is going to know because Bernie uh, was with the Bobcats uh, for some of their more miserable seasons. And he coached in 13 games going 4-9, I'm going to assume that this is in order. So he's fired after those 30, 13 games, and Dick Mata takes over. Dick Mata, was Dick Mata ever a referee as well, or am I thinking of somebody else? 
Or was Dick Mata? Uh, that's Dick Vavetta. Dick Vavetta. Thank you. That's the name I'm thinking of. Dick Mata uh, coaches this team the rest of the way, I guess. Uh, 17 to 50, 17 and 52 record. But here's the funny part: is that Bernie Bickerstaff was also the GM. Uh, which was, again, the situation in, in the Bobcats. Bernie Bickerstaff really wanted to be the GM of the Bobcats, but they talked him into being the coach, and it didn't work out, and he gets fired from both. Uh, it's the exact same thing that happened in Denver. Maybe maybe the Bobcats should have done a little bit of research and uh, decided to not go in that direction. But guess who takes over for Ver- Ber- Bernie Bickerstaff as the general manager? It's our old friend, Alan Bristow. Wow. Okay. So come in full circle. I also have another full circle thing here as I'm looking at Mark Jackson. So crazy to see that. Um, Mark Jackson's transaction history is pretty crazy. So transaction Jackson action. Um, <laughs> is this another rabbit hole? <laughs> uh, If you look at this little stint with the Nuggets, he was actually with Indiana for a while. Gets traded by the Indiana Pacers along with Ricky Pierce and a 96 first round draft pick to Denver in exchange for Jalen Rose. So Jalen Rose goes back to Indiana. He and Reggie, awesome offensive players. Okay. So then the Pacers need a point guard. And so what happens is Jackson is traded by the Denver Nuggets alongside LaSalle Thompson back to the Indiana Pacers. So snip, snap, snip, snap. Back to the Indiana Pacers and ends up going on that finals run with Jalen Rose, a part of that team. Not the only interesting transaction here. Jackson was traded by the Toronto Raptors with Muggsy Bogues to the New York Knicks for Chris Childs. Remember, nice little two-piece for Kobe Bryant and 2002 first-round draft pick that would become Kareem Rush, and then Muggsy would end up retiring. So Mark Jackson, Muggsy Bogues also getting traded in a package a long time ago. Oh, man. Okay, that's all very interesting stuff, but I'm now down a rabbit hole on Bernie Bickerstaff's time in Denver. That's okay. We keep moving on. You, you get the platform. I get the platform for useless information. Well, and, and really, I think enjoying this podcast really comes down to enjoying these, these kind of little tidbits of NBA history because I'm looking at this. That's right. And Bernie Bickerstaff, as a general manager, decided to, as general manager of the Denver Nuggets, decided not to re-sign Dikembe Mutombo. Okay, here's the thing, Walker, and you can back me up on this or not, because you're a little younger than me, so this might not apply to you. But Denver really is, in my mind, the quintessential franchise that I think of, that I associate with being a kid and a franchise being like the ultimate losing franchise. Like Denver, during the the majority of my childhood, was a miserable franchise, bottom of the barrel. It wasn't until they got Carmelo Anthony later on and then and by then I was already in high school and moving on to college and different things like that. So that's when they started to become the respectable franchise they were today. But I can't think of another franchise that more represented losing than the, than the Denver Nuggets. And Bernie Bickerstaff was a big part of that because he, he <laughs> didn't re-sign to Kimbe Mutombo and he traded away Jalen Rose. Two pretty big boners. Yeah. Yeah, and then traded Mark Jackson, the guy that he traded Jalen Rose for. You know, that's so. So, I, I think that I think he probably is still a part of that team. Maybe not. I just know the Denver Nuggets would end up doing that pretty quickly after trading away Jalen Rose. Yeah, I'm looking at the Nuggets playoff history, Doug. It's not what I remember, but it's hard to defend when you go on a playoff hiatus from '95, '96. 2002 2003 so you're close to 10 years one two three four five six seven eight years without a playoff appearance before you get back there and that's Carmelo Anthony's rookie season where you lose a game to the Timberwolves and 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 my childhood the the teams you would think of right off of the bat who would compete with the Nuggets you're thinking Timberwolves you're thinking Sacramento Kings you're thinking Charlotte Hornets well remember the Charlotte Hornets team, Mash, David Wesley, one game away from getting to the conference finals. Timberwolves, Kevin Garnett, relevant, never had enough help around him, but they're getting to the postseason. They have one of the best defensive players, one of the best players, period, of all time. And Sacramento, man, like that was their only thing they could brag about. That year where they had Weber, Christie, Peja Stojakovic. So this was a weird type of era where you had normally the bad organizations and and a lot of other parts of their history this was all the time where they were actually decent and it's the Denver Nuggets who aren't able to bounce back until they get Carmelo and then since really 2003 they've been a pretty nice mainstay for the postseason except there was a five-year hiatus in between there too 
So sudden death over time. Uh, I love that. I love, I think, you know, we talk a yeah, lot about the Elam ending, you know, being instituted in the G league this season, but hopefully, you know, one day we're, we're talking about the Elam ending, not just being an all-star game thing, but maybe even being an NBA thing. But I think honestly, you get to three overtimes. I'm ready for this thing to be over. I say three overtimes. It's no DQ. I'm talking I'm talking chairs, tables, ladders, and chairs, baby. You can use anything. Barbed wire. I don't care. You can use anything. Are they gonna and, sign Ric Flair for this? Yeah, exactly. I want I want the Undertaker involved. I want Hell in a Cell. That's three overtimes. Four overtimes, I think it's like no basketball. You take the basketball away, you go slaps only. It's just a fight to the death until uh we we end this thing. Um because okay. I just those four or five overtime games are just miserable. If 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 there's ever a time we get to five or six overtimes, if that ever happens, at that point, I say we take an hour break. We actually wait for them to reveal the hardwood. If there's a hockey arena underneath, and then we have them play hockey, and then whoever wins scores sudden death as far as shooting it into the net with mugs like Muggsy Bogues running out there, or now we can have Lamelo being the scorer. That's what I want to see. Just play hockey and play on a different surface. Well, you know, we or we could institute. You know what my I idea has always been to really up the tension on the skills challenge you know the skills challenge is something that in in the nba all-star weekend has really been relegated to a joke like it doesn't mean anything it's not interesting it's not really all that fun to watch and i've had this great idea for years as to how to punch it up and i don't know why people uh aren't accepting it i've i've emailed adam silver dozens of times never gotten a response but you know what that idea is right um, I don't know what that idea is. I mean, well, you, you have been so many. I don't me know because which you, one you and I have been doing that. a show together for years, and I've pro- I can't help but mention it. But the skills challenge needs to be the floor, or in this point, or at this uh, uh, the court. If we're talking about the the NBA floor, is lava. The court is lava, <laughs> and it's actual lava. And if you step on it, you die. Yeah, that would uh, increase look. the tension. Yeah, and, and you tune in. It, it is the it is the guy that is promoting walking across the canyon on a high wire, and you only tune in to see if he dies or not. And that's that's what the skills challenge needs to be. Yeah. Now, now some obviously the players union would have to approve. That'd be a tough sell. But and also they'd have to figure out you know what happens to that salary. Does it become actual dead money? Uh, you know, what, what would be the issue there? Uh, so a hey, lot, you know, there's some logistical things to figure out for sure. Hey, maybe the players would decide to do that instead of the in-season tournament. Maybe <laughs> like it'd be close. <laughs> yeah. Risk your life or play in an in-season tournament. You know, I'm going to go ahead and risk my life. Yeah. Hello. Floor is lava, baby. Uh, cool. All right. Well, Hey, this has been a fun episode. I really appreciate it. Uh, Walker. Yeah. Fun game. And you never know. You never know what the bees machine is going to deliver. It is, uh, legitimately random. This, this came to us. Uh, I, you know, the bees machine delivers what the bees machine delivers. So, uh, I can't wait to jump into the next era. Uh, we, we broken this all up into eras. So we're in the sort of late Hornets era and now we'll, we'll move back into the Bobcat zone. I think, um, pretty soon. So, uh, hope, hopefully you've subscribed already for free to every Hornets box score.com. But, but if you haven't, I encourage you to, and if you like what we do here, including the, uh, the game notes that I'm releasing in preseason and the, uh, recap articles I have going up every week talking about what's going on in Hornets land. If you're enjoying any of that, please consider just a couple of bucks a month, uh, signing up for the premium version of the site. It does directly help me continue, uh, to pay for some of the services that it takes to make this particular product that you're watching now, but also some of the other stuff that I plan to do in the future. So uh, with that, I will say go Hornets, go America, let's swarm Charlotte.